So we have um, about 45 minutes for discussion. And for the recording, we're going to use this microphone and pass it around. And I can kind of run around to people who have questions or comments. Um, or if you're close to someone, you can just pass it. So if anyone wants to go first, I can bring this over to you. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, Either. Um, I'm fairly new to all this, so maybe just to kick the discussion off, one of you could give a, if, if you would, a, a brief definition of what archetypal psychology or spirituality is. Um, I got most of it from, from your various talks, but just sort of like a archetypal frame 101. Basically, I, I, I think maybe the best way to start to understand an archetype <clears throat> is just to start with uh, the principle of beauty. So like beauty, the beautiful, capital B, is an archetype. And the beautiful transcends everything in the universe that we experience. Everything participates in the principle of beauty. But nothing is the absolute principle of beauty other than the archetype that transcends all phenomenal world, all of the phenomenal world. Um, and what we recognize in astrology in particular is that the planet Venus has a specific relationship to the principle of beauty. And so where Venus is in your birth chart and how it is an aspect or relates to the other planets in your chart gives you an, un an inclination or an intimation of to how you are working with the principle of Venus, how it's kind of coming through in your life maybe how it likes to be actualized um, relative to the other planets that it might be an aspect in or aspect with or the house that it's in or the sign that it's in will color or stylize in certain ways that principle in your life. Also, um, we recognize that where Venus is in the sky relative to where it was when you were born. So these are called transits when the, the planets continue to move after your birth. So your birth chart is a fixed position of where the planets were at that moment. And then they continue to move and as they make geometric mathematical relationships back to where they were when you were born, both archetypes become activated. So the planetary transiting um, force will activate a natal configuration and both archetypal principles are illuminated and activated in your life. So you can um, participate in a more conscious way ultimately with the principle of beauty when you recognize um, first in your natal chart, what your general disposition is to it, and then as you experience transits of Venus and or transits to Venus from other planets, you can participate in the collect or the, the unification of both principles coming through. And it seems as though the more consciousness we bring to it and the more understanding we have of the, the multi layers of each archetype, because they're extremely multi-dimensional, we can um, use our will to move in a direction that is more life enhancing or more supportive for our experience rather than um, participating in the shadow, potential shadow sides of the archetypes. Every archetype has both noble and less noble expressions, um, positive and shadow dimensions. So we're all participating in them, we're all expressing them in ways and um, the majority of history on some level you can see as an unconscious participation in the archetypes because um, they're informing our experience all the time, but we're, it seems as though at this moment in history we're really just beginning um, a new relationship <laughs> to them uh, because of the, the newly forged human autonomous individual that had to separate itself from the pre-given things like I was mentioning before. We had to kind of separate ourselves and forge human independence and autonomy separate from any like um, idea of what mom and dad thought we should be. I mean, like all the previous religions. On some level, you could see this as a psychological development of like the collective human species as, as like one individual. And that it, it's at the Copernican revolution that we kind of are, reach our adolescence phase and say that, you know, we actually know more than what mom and dad have been telling us for 2,000 years or however long. And so it's kind of an adolescent phase of, of selfhood. Um, and then 
this is allowing, I think, <clears throat> a more conscious, per, per, the, the, the potential for a more conscious integration and relationship to the archetypes, whereas before we kind of forged the autonomous self, we were participating in them in, in largely unconscious ways. So, I, sorry I tangented it a little bit, but does that answer your question on it does. what an archetype is? Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Yeah. great. You're welcome. I mean, maybe um, to, to um, be specific, you, asking about, you asked originally about archetypal psychology. Mm -hmm. um, Chad just gave a great uh, description of archetypal cosmology. But without archetypal cosmology, yeah. <laughs> right. But but um, without the groundwork laid by archetypal psychology, this new um, astrological perspective called archetypal cosmology wouldn't really have been possible. Um, and archetypal psychology was really brought forth by Carl Jung, um, you know, a student of Freud's, who Jung thought that the psyche was more multi-dimensional and that the unconscious wasn't just sexual lust but that there were more principles at work um, and you know through decades of research he eventually came to call them archetypes um, Freud focused almost almost exclusively on on eros you could say you know desire um, but there are other archetypes um, there's the mother archetype the father archetype um, you know beauty is one um, you know, any sort of universal idea that has many particular uh, exemplifications is an archetype. Um, one thing that Jung did that's really significant is he suggested that the ego, the, the identity that we usually identify with in our daily life, is itself just another archetype in relationship to all these other archetypes in the psyche. So he, he was trying to sort of balance this um, overemphasis, this hubris that you know, the modern world uh, um, has carried, where we, we, we focus on the, the rational, uh, freely acting autonomous ego uh, to the detriment of all of these other psychological um, principles and, and, and beings, really. You know, other, like Jung talked about archetypes as, as their own, having their own autonomy. And when we only focus on our ego consciousness, uh, all of those unconscious archetypes start, you know, sneaking up on us and, and having effects in our lives that we don't even realize that they're having. So when it comes to archetypal cosmology, now the idea is the psyche is not just in our heads. It's not just inside of our skull. It's actually, you know, at least the whole solar system, but ultimately the entire universe. And the archetypes now become associated with the planets. And, you know, there's a many millennial, uh, many thousand year uh, history of, of assigning archetypes to specific planets just based on observation and experience that has been accumulated. And, you know, each planet has its own archetypal significance and it, as Chad was describing, um, astrology allows us to enter into a relationship with those uh, archetypes, those planetary archetypes in a way that's not as unconscious as it has been in the past. So. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Can I add something to the sure. question? Which just is. It's, it's, you can just repeat it because it's really short. Okay, Why yeah. do you say archetypal cosmology as opposed to archetypal astrology? That's a great question. <clears throat> the question was <clears throat> why do we say archetypal cosmology instead of archetypal astrology? And <clears throat> that's a really good question. I. I kind of think it's probably twofold. Um, I think um, archetypal cosmology is more mm, comprehensive on some level. And uh, part of it, I think, is the stigma, honestly, that the word ast astrology has in, 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 in culture, academic culture. Please. I have something. Go ahead. Um, because what archetypal astrology points to <coughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what archetypal astrology points to is an archetypal cosmology. So when you understand how astrology works, by understanding the nature of archetypes and then understanding how the movement of the planets correlates to your psyche and the collective psyche, that points towards an archetypal cosmology. So astrology is 
kind of the guardian of the threshold to open us up into a world view that is radically participatory, co-creative, meaningful, filled with intelligence and purpose, and that hap happens to correlate with the movement of the planets. And through studying the movement of the planets, astrology, you can get a deeper sense of what an archetypal cosmology would look like. So Chad is saying it's more encompassing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> the one thing I guess maybe just to add to that is that <clears throat> we are literally in the very earliest stages of this perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's only in the last 30 years that we've really kind of honed in what archetypal astrology is. And, um, <clears throat> and it's, a, it's a language. It's a, I mean, it's a language that's been with us from the beginning, but it's reformulated in a new way because of our reformulation of human individuality and autonomy. We've basically developed a situation where we're, where we're a legitimate partner for the cosmos because we've separated ourselves and differentiated and forged and grown to be autonomous and individual, separated ourselves from all the superstitious aspects of astrology and stuff that were part of the tradition, and now we're capable of in moving back into a new relationship with it. And it's not regressive, it's, it's, it's progressive. Um, it's like a spiral of evolution, we're in a new place, a new perspective to, to make this relationship. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say, but I'm sure it'll come, it'll come in a second. Um, any other questions? I was just going to add a little quick thing on that. Thanks. I just wanted to mention <clears throat> just another idea that I was having coming up about that, that whole question. Um, that whole idea is just potentially that archetypal cosmology encompasses more than just astrology. It's yeah. like astrology is a, is a tool and a, a kind of, yeah. inc when you really understand it's an incredibly sort of all encompassing on one way. I mean, it, you, you know, it's, it's such a, a blueprint and has such a, a deep correlation in the fact that the planets are right here with us. So it, it, you really can't split them, but at the same time, it seems like archetypal cosmology potentially has more uh, stream, it has certain streams to it that astrology may not even be a part of. It might have like yeah. certain layers of it that is like the cosmology of archetypes themselves or different personality structures and uh, or different layers of consciousness in general that might not be astrological in particular. And so if it was archetypal astrology, then it would kind of only, it would have more of that focus or is cosmology, like you were saying, more encompassing. Yeah, I, that's actually what I was trying to say. Right. Yeah, when you that said was, that, I thought maybe I'm picking up on yeah, this. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks. I just wanted to add something to that was you can practice astrology without being participating in a in an archetypal cosmology. So there's been astrology before this understanding of archetypal cosmology and that astrology is a, an astrology that's deterministic, fatalistic, it's causal because it's coming out of more of a, you know, not only a Newtonian Cartesian understanding but even before then you're still a victim of the gods and it's still a hierarchical relationship and an archetypal cosmology it brings you into a not only a different ontology and epistemology by the very nature of your existence but the way you interact with the astrology radically shifts and there's an evolution that's taking place in how we see our relationship to the divine therefore the astrology that we practice practice also takes a major radical shift. I think the astrology in archetypal cosmology is what makes it archetypal astrology versus just astrology. That's great. Uh, I would just add one other thing like that, which is the archetypal cosmology holding um, just basically a, a larger vision of a participatory epistemology or participating with the cosmos and the archetypes at large which can occur in other ways other than astrology so I was just thinking of something like you know tarot or the I Ching there are ways to relate to the archetypes in a, in a participatory way that isn't necessarily astrology so uh, I like what that was and just that idea that differentiation um, my question was very much on this on this theme, which was like I really like Chad what you said about um, that quote I guess, which is looking down the floorboards of the soul, which fan out uh, to reveal the, the starry firmament. And I just had you know I don't even know if this is a question, but it's more just kind of like uh, you know ideas that that were coming for me, which was like this idea, this project that we have to to re-enchant the universe and like. 
uh, being in the stage of kind of the autonomous, inflated ego um, that we've that we've entered in historically, and kind of this idea of reawakening to an intelligent and like active um, harmony of celestial order, it seems to come from like an inward, downward direction. Like that metaphor is really interesting, looking down into the soul, which fans out to reveal the star starry firmament, and it made me think almost of what what Rick Tarnas often says, which is astrology is kind of like the gold standard of superstition today, and that we find ourselves in a really interesting place in which it, it almost seems like the macrocosmic upwards outward, you know, way of talking about things is almost, it's, it's really challenging when you try and talk to someone, if you try and talk about that out, exterior upward kind of, say, astrology, it seems to turn people into a really defensive, skeptical stance. And w there's been like a movement, which is kind of what Matt was, you were saying about coming from like Carl Jung or Hillman, like that basically that quote from Jung of since the stars have fallen, we have to f find like, you know, depth psychology, that basically it's more um, appropriate or something to talk about the psyche or the unconscious. It's almost easy to talk about myths and dreams and the collective unconscious uh, rather than, you know, Uranus and Saturn as like these potent forces of archetypal significance and correlation. And so I guess just if you guys have thoughts on that, like if that's a general stream, like in a way we have to be coming, there's some kind of a movement that because we've been consolidated into an individual inflated ego that carries all meaning, as you were saying, Chad, that it's almost like I'm curious as we try and bring this re-enchantment to our culture, how we can engage in a way that will be most receptive. And if you guys think that that might be hmm. some reference point from the kind of depth psychological perspective, if there's, you know, it's a little bit easier for right. people to swallow right. if you're talking the unconscious about. inside of us, you know, or like, yeah. you know, we have figures in anima and, you know, within us that we can then, there seems to almost be two projects of like yeah. acknowledging that and then also, you know, establishing a psyche, a polytheistic or multivalent yeah. psyche, but and then also also, to reveal that there's psyche outside of us in yeah. the cosmos, you know, that psyche is also in the universe. So, just a general kind of opening question: How you guys see yeah. that? That's the, a great question. That you guys project. Right. You go first okay. if you got some. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's great. I um I I do. I think what we're talking about here is perfect. It's like you know, archetypal astrology has been our vehicle into the archetypal cosmology perspective. It's like astrology is what's given us an empirical ground, for me anyway, to, to deeply believe in an archetypal cosmology. It's like, I'm, I'm a logical kind of scientific person and I needed proof. And um, you know, I was into astrology and I saw lots of things in my own chart and my friends and all of that, but honestly it wasn't until I read Cosmos and Psyche and saw like the broad cultural influence that the planets have over whole sweeps of time and it's not based on any individual subjectivity. Um, that to me was proof, you know, tremendous proof that this was happening. And I, I think what you're saying, it's really important, um, like what we can do, you can use, like say you're a therapist and you have the birthday of your client, you can use astrology you can understand archetypally what's happening in that person's chart through their natal chart, through their transits, and then you can actually have a session with them and not mention a word of astrology. You can talk about it archetypally, about what's happening in their soul. Just knowing the archetypes, just referencing those different qualities within their experience and not mention a lick of the planets or any of that. You know, So I think um, Ultimately, what you're saying is right. You know, it's 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 uh, it's not necessarily dependent on the planets per se to give us the insight. It's uh, it's just that the planets reflect that genuine fact that we are participating in their motions. Um, I think it can be extremely helpful for people, some people, to to have that awareness. I also think that there are other people who it might not help them. Like they're they're kind of so involved in their creative process or their life or whatever that like this it would just be kind of extraneous information but if you can talk about it archetypally with them and get them to understand the, you know, where the way they feel about things and, and, then, and then maybe even you know bring in you know, well this won't last forever because you know what transits involved that is correlating to that experience and then you can talk about how you want to work with it for a certain period of time 
and then maybe how things might open up after that, that type of thing. So I think there's tremendous ways to use astrology without actually referencing it as, as a, you know, as a discipline or a science or, or an art or whatever. Is that, hmm. is that, did you, do you have a follow-up or anything that? Uh, no, I don't know if Matt, you had anything to add on that. Yeah, well, just playing on the idea that, I mean, something um, Hillman talks a lot about, and the metaphor that you've brought up a lot is the notion of growing down rather than growing up. You know, the idea is that adults are supposed to grow up, but in so doing, there's that, that sense of um, transcendence that I think is related to what Copernicus did by shifting to a heliocentric astronomy. Um, he was identifying with the sun and taking the sun's perspective and I think that is archetypally what science is all about. You, you, it's almost like you step off the earth and take this view from nowhere, this view from uh, from the center that lets you see the motion of all the planets without yourself being moving. And of course now we know the Sun actually is moving, it's flying through the galaxy at, you know, 250 miles per second or whatever. But the arch archetypally that's, you know, Copernicus was growing up with, with so quickly Ident and identifying with the sun that he forgot his embeddedness in the earth. And I think what's interesting about astrology and challenging at the same time is that it's geocentric. For it to work, you have to consider it from the geocentric perspective, from the perspective of earth, so that earth becomes the measure of the orbits again of the other planets. Um, you know, and it's a challenge for me to think about how our scientific perspective, which is obviously true in some important sense that the earth is not at the center, how to balance that with our embodied lived experience of the sun rising and sun setting and the moon rising and setting and everything moving around the earth as if we were at the center. Um, I'm not exactly, you know, I kind of hold that as a paradox that they're both true in some important sense, but I think it's really important the reason I find archetypal cosmology so important as, is as a balance and a psychological corrective to that disembedded, disembodied solar um, perspective. Because um, it brings us back to the Earth and shows us that you know, we look at the universe and we live in the universe from Earth out. You know, we don't live on the sun. Even if we can imagine um, what it might be like to be the solar logos and to see the world from that perspective, we're actually Earthlings. And I think, um, you know, rediscovering astrology in this postmodern or post postmodern or integral context uh, has a lot to do with becoming Earthlings again, um, while not forgetting science, but just uh, trying to embody it more. Uh, That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> Caleb. Oh, well, I just I was thinking exactly that same thing, Matt. It's uh, from the Earth's perspective that the mathematics is too complex, we couldn't even calculate these the planetary motions. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the sun becomes a, the heliocentric perspective that the math all of a sudden works. And so when we do astrology, we have to have that heliocentric perspective just to run the computer program that tells us where the planets are going to be. Right. But it's all, from the Earth perspective where all the beauty is, where all the complexity and the, and the, the mystery exists. Mm -hmm. And being an astrologer is an interesting place. It's like being the musician who understands theory and then can play the music, but, but not that the music is the theory. And so you don't get lost into the theoretical side. You really want to listen to the music and, and have it move your soul. Mm -hmm. And so like what you're saying, Chad, just being able to, um, as a, an astrologer, to sit mathematically from the, from the heliocentric perspective and understand what's happening logically, but then bring it into this um, complex, real-world Earth experience, this geocentric experience, right. and that's a that's a that's a weird place to be, and uh, to be able to incorporate to to ride the bicycle without thinking about it, so to speak, to be in that meditative state. Um, it's beautiful to see the math, you know, and as astrologers know, to see the angles and realize, oh wow, I've seen this angle before. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It has no meaning to someone who isn't into the mathematical, the heliocentric perspective. Right, yeah. I think w Chad mentioned that Plato's god was order, basically, and it was a mathematical order. You know, and it seems really abstract, but he was also a Pythagorean. And that order, that mathematical order, order was a, a musical harmony at the same time. And I don't think Plato thought of them separately. You know, he didn't, for him, numbers weren't just like units that you, that you add up to uh, add to one another, they, each number 
had its own archetypal significance, its own sound. Numinous. It was numinous, yeah. Um, it's qualitative. The qualitative numbers, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, math is music, and Plato didn't conceive of those as separate things. And to take people who scientists who are in that heliocentric perspective and to talk about the, the mysterious qualitative value of numbers is just as bizarre as telling them that the Earth is the center of the universe and come here and watch the sun and moon in an eclipse mm -hmm. and how beautiful that is. And they're like, well, you know, that's not really true, don't you? <laughs> yeah. But it is true. It's true from our perspective. I think I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's interesting, though, also, um, physics describes uh, the universe as omnicentered. So it's, from their best guess, it's actually expanding from all points in all directions. So in between the galaxies and everything, it's actually moving outwardly in all directions from every point. And the, the newest science they have on it is that it's actually accelerating. So the, the universe, the galaxies are moving farther away from each other at an accelerated rate. So not only are they not going to have the big crunch where gravity of the universe will collect all the mass and bring it back together, what they're seeing now is that it's actually accelerating farther and farther apart. But it, back to the point of omnicenteredness, it seems as though um, what the astrological perspective renders is that every human being is a center of cosmic meaning. That you have your own specific relationship to the cosmos, to the divine, through your birth chart. And that it <clears throat> is loves you, it cares for you so much that it allows you to see yourself in an objective form in relationship to the cosmos itself and to participate in the movements of the cosmos and the movements of the planets over time in your life and to have a conscious integration or a conscious uh, participation in those periods of life where certain archetypal dynamics are going to be more strongly active than others. So you can have an uh, idea of when those periods are and you can align your will to strive to embody the most life enhancing qualities of those archetypal combinations. So it seems as though there's a real opportunity for a new relationship to, to be born in with ourselves, with the, our relationships with the depth of our own psyche and with the relationship of time and history. So that's where I'm just blown away. <laughs> and it's not only is it it's focusing on every individual in this room and on this planet, it also is conscious of all of our interactions in relationship to where the planets are right now in the sky. Um, if you sit and really try and understand it, it, it it's extremely difficult and it yeah. blows my mind every time I'm trying to really grasp how much intelligence is involved to orchestrate something so complex and in a consistent manner and it's present in every moment. It's, it's, it's constantly doing this for us. Um, yeah. It's challenging. In some ways we're trying to uh, you know, we're, we're almost courting the planets again. You know, we were divorced for a while, and now we're trying to come back into relationship, and it, it's difficult, and I think it's, that's why I kind of, I like this term, um, psychoplanetary therapy, you know, yeah. that we're, we're trying to re-engage with one another to figure out, wait, what happened? How did we end up like this, and mm -hmm. how do we get back together, you know? So it's, yeah, it's exciting and difficult and yeah. fascinating. That's great. How and why? How and why. Yeah, and the why has just as much meaning. Right. Yeah. Right. It's important to understand. Right. Mm -hmm. It's as if there's there's another dancing set again. There's Saturn and there's Uranus. And before Copernicus, um, there was this structure that um, was this one partner. And then after Copernicus, where the um, heliocentric point of view gave the mathematical solution to how to solve the problem of the planets, mm -hmm. threw us out of the Garden of Eden, and now we're the, with the other partner, Uranus, and we're individuated, we're autonomous, the stars have fallen, they're no longer appreciated the way they were before, and we have to go deep inside to find those stars again 
through depth psychology or you know, prof mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now there's the heliocentric and the geocentric in which we have this personal individual perspective as well as dancing with the former mm -hmm. heliocentric. So these two partners are learning how to, you know, jive with each other. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry. Uh, going with, um, I think, what Chad said about if you view humanity as one person and the embeddedness of the human within the, um, the geocentric perspective, it's like that human child's relationship to the mother um, and the form that astrology took at that time being deterministic is like the mother saying, no, you have to do this, you have to do that. There's no kind mm -hmm. of argument. You're punished if you try and break out of that. That's great. And then with what Matt was just, you know, and then there's the, as you said, the adolescent separation. We know more than you. Mm -hmm. You don't mean anything. And then what Matt was saying of courting the planets, now the human individual or human species individual is an adult and yeah. able to take on this romantic relationship to the cosmos and you know this we've been using this metaphor of dancing it's like the f the first step of yeah. that um, and moving into a loving relationship and each partner can um, equally bring um, to that meaning that's great yeah beginning to re-respect the elders mm -hmm. and dance with them. Mm -hmm. And just um, kind of following up on Jessica's idea of the, the gods being excited when they have conscious mm. partners, I think it's sort of like the excitement of a parent that's seeing their mm. their child maturing and that's being able to be a conscious participant in their own lives. And so I think when, um, when we start to do some kind of a discipline, whether it's depth psychology or actually practicing astrology to become more mindful participants in the archetypal um, patternings of our lives, I think there is this moment, um, I, I certainly have felt it in my own life, where there's a sense of my own excitement, and then also I think there is that sense of recognizing the excitement of the dance partner that's like, oh, we get to do this together now. Um, and uh, so yeah, thank you for that. So mostly when we when we speak about astrology, we put it in connection with uh, with psychology. But I wonder, for example, if you look at uh, medieval and classical tradition, then you see that the astrology had much more larger meaning. It was actually pervading every structure of reality, every sphere of reality. And it seems to me that astrology, as we know it today, or as most of the people knows it today, is strictly focused on psychology. But in that point of view, if you want to bring that tradition back to modern way of understanding of reality do if you want to in certain way to unite it with science uh, it seems to me that we stand in front of a challenge to bring astrology also to for example natural sciences like bi biology chemistry medicine mm -hmm. I wonder what are, what are your thoughts in, in in this direction what what steps should be taken because clearly uh, if, if you and this is also what Rick told me in uh, in our correspondence uh, simply if the archetypes are kind of cosmic deities pervading every structure, every 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 layer of cosmos, of, of, of reality, mm -hmm. then it seems that there must be other cycles which are not, which are still informed by the same uh, planetary archetypes, yet they are not uh, corresponding with the movements of the, of the planets. Or if so, it, it, they, they, are, they may be more hidden, they may be more uh, kind of inscripted. So, for example, for, for the ancients, it was it was clear to distinct the power of of, of Mercury in, in certain natural processes. In, uh, and, and when you when you've seen when you were able to identify this power, you have you have seen certain uh, structures being being taken in the in the very shape of, of plants, of, of uh, animals, and in in um, organs in the, in the human body. Mm -hmm. So this seems to me that this is an important fragment or part of the astrological tra tradition which we are actually missing, which we are not bringing in. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, 
it can only offer like the very beginnings of a uh, approach to how astrology might affect more than just the human psyche. But you know, I think to look at biology in particular, um, you know, scientists now they talk about the genotype and the phenotype. Mm. Um, in a more enchanted context, a more archetypal context, you talk about the archetype of an organism as well, which I think is more, it's actually more concrete uh, of a way to understand an individual organism because it, it factors in um, the, bo the birth of a particular organism and it's, it's time of birth. So you're not just looking at the genetic code or the, the phenotype of the whole species, but you're looking at that individual, what is going into the birth of that particular individual animal or organism. Um, and the other thing is in biology, there's no, there's no real explanation for where a mutation comes from. You know, it's, they just say it's random, which is, to my mind, the exact opposite of an explanation. <laughs> it's only unknown, it's not random. It, right, so, you know, I think with deeper study, um, and you know, we need to discover new techniques too and methods of study. Like, wh what is it exactly that the relationship between the, the planets, planetary aspects, and DNA could be, for example? You know, um, I would intuit that there must be some relationship. It's just a matter of decoding how exactly these things line up. But, you know, in the future, we could go back, you know, to look at like the Cambrian explosion. That's when all of the, the metazoa, the multicellular animals, appeared almost all at once. Every body plan that exists today was born in a very brief period of time, like a million years, about 550 million years ago, Cambrian explosion. Why did it happen then? Well, what was in the sky? We can look to see and you know, begin making these correlations to see if there is indeed a relationship, and I'd suspect that there would be. That's great. I'm not sure if we have accurate calendar measurements for how that far back in the future where the planets are, right. but eventually I think we will. That's mm -hmm. great. And uh, I, real quick, um, one thing uh, I, that um, like you can see the history of quantum mechanics, the history of world wars, um, many, like Cosmos and Psyche is really focused on not the individual psychological relationship to the planets, but more the collective. Um, but you can see the history of quantum mechanics in the Jupiter-Uranus cycle. A lot of scientific discoveries take place during Jupiter-Uranus conjunctions and oppositions. And the reason is <clears throat> Jupiter grants success and Uranus is the technological leap on some level and um, even quantum leap. Um, so you can, you can see uh, things in the material world, uh, in the phenomenal world outside of the human psyche being affected or influenced or in correlation with, with the planetary motions. Um, one other thing I wanted to add real quickly is that astrology was not done <clears throat> for individuals in the same way that it is, it is now prior to the Copernican revolution. Like human, <coughs> human autonomy <clears throat> and individuality just wasn't as um, cherished and supported prior to the Copernican revolution. Um, the astrology tended to be done for the king or for the pope or for the country or for any given sense, sense are we, should we go to war, that kind of thing, rather than individual biography, what's happening in your life, that, that sense of understanding of individuality just wasn't present. There are birth charts for individuals prior to that, but it just was not the main focus. And post-Copernicus into the, you know, the forging of the autonomous human individuality, individuality and the American and French revolutions just you know, uh, exploding that phenomenon, it moves us towards the humanistic <coughs> um, approach towards life and therefore Astrology focuses more on a humanistic approach. But of, sorry, but of course this go, this gives perfect sense because if we if we consider certain evolution of, of uh, human consciousness that the process of individuation on collective level is uh, speeding up, then of course during the medieval ages and in the classical ages there were not so many individuals, so there will no point to doing. Uh, uh, exact uh, birth chart for that John over there because that John over there he actually was not per real personality per se. So right. this this was mm -hmm. me, uh, meaningful for really for kings and for right. people who who were important. Or influential people, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, if I if I may uh, short feedback for for what you said uh, that you mean mean it means that you understand the <coughs> possible usage of astrology in, for example, biology in making a birth chart of an animal because you need to have a personality in, in order to be able not to not to tell I, you about the 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 personality of the animal, but just as another, another factor in what might be causing mutations 
in that particular animal's hmm. DNA or genome. Yeah. But one that brings these to it's okay. There's a couple questions in the back. Did too, Matthew want to say something about Nick this Matthew too? Say something. Just real quick, just time. to comment on this question. Um, oh, I in in the history of astrology, I think what you were, I thought what you were saying was that there was a period where there was a marriage of astrology with many other disciplines, and it, like for example, astrology used to be totally um, taught together with medicine. There was, uh, doctors mm -hmm. learned astrology, and they still do, like in the Chinese system of astrology and Vedic system of astrology, there's a total marriage of um, astrology and medicine. And, Ayurvedic. Um, and so I, I think, th though, that it makes sense that at this point in history that, that astrology would be focused on the individual, uh, psychological astrology, because first we have to go within to even discover this new perspective, this new worldview. And my sense is that as our worldview evolves, if it does open to this larger archetypal perspective, that it would open the way for astrology to be integrated into many other disciplines. Mm -hmm. But while the uh, worldview is cur you know, currently uh, uh, as it is, you know, there's not going to be much room for astrology to get you know, integrated into genetics or into uh, meteorology or, or whatever. Um, yeah, the one thing I went quick, quickly, uh, the, the speculative realism talks that were here last uh, semester, um, I, which is like a new branch of philosophy. I actually think that um, astrology can really help that um, perspective because they're striving to speculate it within objects. And they and they're when I, what I've read of like Grant Harmon's work, he's he's literally talking about archetypes. He's talking about the the essential withdrawn nature of of an object, something that's present, that's eternal inside it, but it's ultimately infinitely withdrawn, mm -hmm. which sounds just like an archetype. And I feel like there's a, an, an empirical tool at their usage that they're not quite aware of yet that might actually really help the speculative realism um, track kind of find its ground and, and uh, because what's happening is like with the 60s, the Uranus, Uranus and Pluto were in a conjunction during the 60s and it correlates to the radical transformation and liberation and all the revolutions that took place during that decade. Right now, we're in the first hard aspect alignment between those two planets. Uranus and Pluto are square to each other right now and will be for the next, you know, solidly for the next five years, but really through the end of the decade. And the fact that we can see the same qualities of experience taking place now that we saw in the 60s gives us, uh, it moves us beyond the absolute speculative nature of speculative realism. We, we actually have an insight into the interiority of the quality of experience that is being experienced cross-culturally in large, large parts of the world, in the Middle East right now, but it you know, happened in, in, in across the world really in the 60s, but then the French Revolution is another decade that had Uranus-Pluto like radical transformation take place. So I feel like we're no longer kind of in the dark with a kind of an absolute speculative nature of trying to understand the interiority of things. We actually have an empirical tool to address and try and assess what the interiority of ex people's experience and collective people's experiences actually is at any given time. So I think we're, it's really, um, it has a lot of implications for the nature of our understanding of reality. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it's a proof of Plato's initial vision that the cosmos were deeply ensouled and that the human being has a special relationship to it, and that we have an, an intelligible. We, we can we can make it intelligible. We can find we can make ourselves more intelligible. And actually, it's uh, this is um, from from Plato too. It's the philosopher's task upon being reborn. And he was talking about like after going through the Eleusinian mystery rites or any initiatory process, um, and you're kind of after dying and being reborn. It's um, it's uh, the philosopher's task after being reborn is to integrate the vision of heaven and immortality with their participation in political life on earth. And he also goes as far as saying basically that, you know, if we don't align ourselves with the order of the heavens, then we're kind of not, I mean, I don't want to say doomed to failure, but we're uh, doomed to alienation. Yeah. Disaster. 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 
Yeah, it's that actually is the root of the word disaster. Disasters, di hmm. disasters star. So it's against the stars. That's cool. Or even catastrophe is the same thing. Catastrophe. So it's when you're not in alignment with the heavens that difficult experiences arise. Um, if you're not kind of in congruence with the order of, of nature. Um, Probably at time for one more question. Yeah, there's a couple in the back. You guys can show them. Heidi, you inspired the I'll try to make it concise. I, this touched on something I've been working with models of um, l spiritual localism, where it's stretching into the idea that this place might be strange enough to support multiple creation myths. We sort of our common sense says one must be true, and that ones that contradict and must be wrong. But what if like the mythic thing's so intense that this place actually has multiple things that are converging and things like that? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking how all the planets are, you know, pretty Greek based in the archetypes as we're describing them, mm -hmm. and yet. Here we are on the planet, we're all sharing the same things overhead, but we're not all sharing the same uh, religious system and different people. It makes sense to me the Greeks looked inside and said, well, we inside have this. They didn't say it in those words, but that's what was inside and they put it outside. But the whole world didn't come up with that same set of deities. Mm -hmm. So um, it, what you guys are talking is right on the fence of where I'm working with of, if we all share that, but we don't all share this, then when it trances, what gets activated? Right. Hmm. That's great, great question, really. Um, obviously, what we have been discussing is Western history. Um, it's Rick's, um, in, it's his specialty. I mean, he was a Harvard graduate historian. Western history was his focus. So therefore, his work focused on what he knew. Um, I think, um, honestly, I think the archetypes are transcultural. Um, I think that they might have different names in other cultures, um, yeah. but I ultimately think it's a cross-cultural phenomenon. Um, and that, I mean, obviously um, in India they have a really strong astrological tradition um, in which they have a very different um, systematic approach and you know, te technolo technique approach, but their, their understanding of the archetypes of the planets are extremely similar to the Greek understanding of, e of the archetypes of the planets. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a lot more agreement about the nature of the archetypes of the planets than there is disagreement amongst astrologers around the world. So mm -hmm. I feel like, um, you know, archetypes, uh, they have cultural inflection. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not a pure dissemination of the archetype in any given experience, in any individual biography. Um, every person in this room is embodying archetypes in their own novel way. You are a co-creator in that process, and no one expresses the archetypes in exactly the same way. And this is why, like, when you do a reading, I don't believe that you can look at a chart and tell them what type of person they are. I believe that your soul is embodying that chart. You are participating in the archetypes, the archetypal dynamics that are laid out in the chart in your own unique, specific way that's relative to your psyche, to your soul, and to your biography, and most likely to your past lives. So yeah. you, are, you are experiencing it in an extremely novel way, and I don't think that, like, um, well, I, I want to address your question more clearly. What, well, just one tip on it, I, that I'm thinking that at that same time period when the Greeks were doing this, it wasn't very many miles away that Judaism was being monotheistic, and I don't know if they're, I don't know enough to know the answer to this, whether they're, they were like, yes, there's only one God, yeah. but there's all these planets, that one still means love and beauty, that one still means yeah. war, that one still means... Well, check this out. <laughs> this is really fascinating, it's one of the most fascinating things I discovered in astrology, uh, Rick pointed it out. Um, there's what's called the axial period of religion. It's cross-culturally understood by religious scholars as this really amazing period from about 600 BC to 560 BC when the Buddha was born, Lao Tzu, Confucius, potentially Zoroaster. It's when the Hebrews were cast out of Babylon in 586 when they began to redact the Hebrew Bible as we know it today. 
um, Pythagoras, Thales, the beginning of ancient Greece, it all starts in this period. It's about a 40 to 60 year window. And it happens to be that the three most outer planets, which were completely unknown to the ancients, were in a triple conjunction. They were all three in the same place in the sky at that period of time. And you have to go back 1,500 years prior for it to happen again. And it doesn't happen again until 3300 AD. So this is an extremely rare alignment with the three most outer planets. And it happens to correspond to what's considered the axial period of religion. And on some level, this is where we really placed a monotheistic understanding of, of, of a divine source into the heavens. And we strive to align the human individual, the human being, with that transcendent divinity. Hmm. And um, every 500 years, Neptune catches up with Pluto. So this was a triple conjunction with all three. And let me just quickly, because uh, Uranus liberates whatever it touches. Neptune is the imagination, the great mother goddess, our understanding of spirituality. It's our perception and our worldview, our stream of consciousness, the way we imagine the world. And Pluto is the evolutionary driving force that transforms everything it's in relationship with. So we liberated the spiritual perspective and it had a deeply transformative process, power added to it with Pluto involved as well. So it was a radical emancipation and deepening Deep, deep transformational ex process that took place over that 60 year period cross-culturally around the world. Um, mm -hmm. Every 500 years since then, Neptune catches up with Pluto and they're basically 500 year paradigms. Um, it begins there, 600 BC, um, right at the end of Greece, 84. It's a 20 year thing, I'm gonna give exact dates. 84 BC, it's uh, just the end of Greece, the beginning of Rome, just prior to Christianity. Um, 400 AD, the end of the Roman Empire, it's really close um, you know, to when Rome actually fell, uh, which is the beginning of the Dark Ages, so the next 500 years is the Dark Ages. Then uh, 900, it moves out of the dark, the early Dark Ages into the high medieval ages, the high medieval um, period. And then the next one is 1400, which is just at the Renaissance. So these are 500 year periods that our, our worldviews, it's like Neptune is our stream of consciousness and the way we imagine the world and Pluto transforms it each time. So there's a transformation of our worldview that takes place with the Pluto-Neptune conjunctions. The, the second to the last one was the Renaissance, which obviously gave us Copernicus and all of modernity. And then the most recent one happened from 1880 to 1905, which is the beginning of the postmodern. Um, quantum physics, relativity, everything that destroyed the modern um, mechanistic Newtonian, me I mean, it, it kind of destroyed it. it, it eclipsed it anyway. It's not like it's destroyed and Newtonian math doesn't work. It's, it works great, it's very convincing. But um, these are huge paradigm shifts that have taken place cross-culturally relative to the three most outer planets, which again, weren't even known until the last 250 years or so. So this is something that is freshly dawning in our consciousness. And um, I, you know, I kind of think like you know, we're learning this language. And what, what happened when people first learned language? It was like sketches and you know, little things. And they, they were roughly, roughly working it out. And then you know, several hundred years later, people wrote novels. <laughs> I mean, so like, I honestly feel like we're at the, scratching the threshold of this integration of an archetypal perspective. And ultimately, we will learn it um, more deeply than we learn the alphabet and how to talk and everything. And I think we'll be able to perceive it in others and in the world naturally, like a second, you know, like you can read easily. It's like you'll just pick up on archetypes within people and you, we will respond and engage in ways that will be reflective of those processes. Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll honor each other in different ways. We'll have more compassion for people because we'll be able to recognize their complexes and where they kind of potentially come from. And rather than being critical and stuff, we'll say, oh, I see what's, where the source of this you know, issue is for you or whatnot. And then it gives you a level of like, acceptance and saying, oh, well, I have that too, or someone else has it, or whatever. I just, I just feel like um, there's a lot of uh, 
compassion that can emerge out of the recognition that we're all participating in the same principles and we're all somewhat, you know, well, I don't know how to finish that exactly, but. Yeah. Unfortunately, this attorney in clock is <laughs> trying to draw us to a close. Well, thank you, all three of you, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. That time went by way too quickly, and if you do want to keep talking about this, I think a few of us are going to go to um, Thai, the restaurant Thai Basil, which is open week food, keep talking, so on. Um, and I also just want to mention that next week for the forum, we're Brian Swim speaking with one of our PCC students, Bonnie Wills, and uh, the title of their presentation is The Mysticism and Cosmology of the American Genius, Howard Thurman. So if you're interested in that, um, definitely please come. It'll be in the same room, uh, 6.30 to 8.30. We'll see you then. Yeah.